When most people think of a Marine, they first think about lethality, but survivability is another critical component to success on the battlefield. The last thing a Marine wants to be without while forward deployed is medical equipment and supplies. Every Marine loves their doc. From bandaging wounds to saving lives, corpsmen are essential. The Expeditionary Medical Systems team within the Logistics Combat Element Systems portfolio is critical to ensuring our medical professionals have the gear, tools, and equipment needed in the field. They provide medical devices and supplies in support of deployed emergency and resuscitative healthcare, meeting or exceeding healthcare provider and warfighter requirements while providing unquestionable value. They're tasked with ensuring Marines have the appropriate equipment so the warfighter gets the medical attention they need as quickly as possible. Today, I am pleased to welcome Navy Commander Kelly Donovan, pharmacist and program analyst with the EMS team. Thank you for joining us today, Commander. Thank you for having me. Before we get started about the job, could you tell us a little bit about your background and how you ended up here at Systems Command? Sure. I've been in Navy medicine for 16 years next week. I was commissioned when I was only 22 straight out of pharmacy school, and I have loved every minute of it. So I started out in Newport, Rhode Island. I went to officer school there and then graduated on a Friday and started Monday at the health clinic there and all throughout New England. After that, I kind of realized where I wanted to go in my niche um, in Navy pharmacy and Navy medicine. And I got picked up to do a critical care residency in trauma and emergency medicine at Naval Medical Center San Diego. So I got to spend four wonderful years there. Um, my first year in residency at the Navy hospital, as well as um, at the civilian level one trauma centers in downtown San Diego. Uh, I got to pay back that wonderful education with a year in Afghanistan at the Combat Trauma Hospital in uh, Kandahar. Well, well, thank you for serving over there. Yeah, it was one of, to this day, one of the most valuable experiences I've ever had. Um, they offered me some further postgraduate education um, in analytics and statistics. But after I graduated with my PhD in that program, they kind of changed their mind, Navy Medicine, and sent me to serve at Naval Medical Center Camp Lejeune. Our Marine-centered healthcare facility there was becoming an open community trauma center. And since my specialty is emergency medicine and, and trauma, which so closely correlates to operational medicine, asked me to go down there and help the pharmacy department and the program down there attain their open trauma certification. We were successful in that in 2018, about six months after I got there. We've since renewed that certification, and we're and the medical center down there is progressing to a level two center in North Carolina. I loved all three years there, um, even with COVID in the middle of a pandemic. I loved my staff. I loved my commanders. And I started getting to work with my Marine Corps partners. And I worked with Second Medlog because um, the Marine Corps didn't have any pharmacists. And 33% of our medical consumables are pharmaceuticals and vaccines. And so... They had to ask the hospital every time they had a question. And after a couple times of asking, and then our partners over at Navy Fleet Forces kept asking, they said, why can't we just own one of you? And I said, you're welcome to. And I wrote a really wonderful white paper and presented it to both of the operational medicine departments. And in October of 2020, the Marine Corps Systems Command called me and they said, well, we agree. And we did it. We went to total force management and we, we converted a, a billet to a pharmacy officer. And would you like to be the first one that does it? I said, yeah, we just have to convince the Navy to uh, let me do that. Well, wow, right. So with anything, if, if you're the one with a great idea, you quite often get asked to be the <laughs> one to, to implement the idea. Yeah, so, absolutely. So, well, well, excellent. I will say having uh, listened to uh, a season and a half of backgrounds, that was one of the more interesting to me, at least. And I, and I thought that was... Uh, was great. I'm sure the listeners are going to enjoy that. You know, I find it fascinating that you can do so many different careers in the military, and you've described several just within the Navy. But what has your experience been as a pharmacist and such in uniform as compared to maybe what you might, uh, what a pharmacist might see out in the civilian world? That is a great question. I, the best part I think about being a uniformed healthcare provider and a uniformed pharmacist is that I can propose almost any idea. And if I explain to my bosses that it's good for them, good for the system, so, you know, hopefully saves money as well, increases our lethality or saves lives, they're going to let me run with it. And so, you know, I've gotten to really get in some interesting rooms just by having the mentality of not coming from no, but ha not yet. I can do that for you if I'm given these things, or I can get to yes 
if given this training or this resource or this space. And I think that is in the private world, we're kind of pigeonholed by what earned you your degree or what brought you. Um, and I'm a big fan of telling the military and the Navy, and I think the Marine Corps is frankly a little better at this than the Navy is, is that being a pharmacist is what brought me in 16 years ago. It's not who I am today. I am not just a pharmacist. You, right. You've trained me to be a project officer that can really go into any round peg situation and, and fit in there and be valuable and exceptional at whatever I'm asked to do. With, with what was that other degree you said in uh, statistics and... And analytics. And yeah. analytics, right. Yeah. So, okay. I, so I thought that was very, my degrees are in mathematics. And so when you said statistics, I was like, that's, that's a very interesting. And I it did the worst in my original degree, my pharmacy degree. Um, the classes I most struggled with was biostatistics. And then, you know, six, eight years later, they sent me to do a PhD in it. And my husband had to laugh because he was just like, are you sure? Are you sure this is, is the elephant you want to eat? Because it was a struggle for you. And I said, absolutely. The Navy says this is what they want. And I, I can say yes to this. I can get there. And you nailed it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, good to go. So I understand that EMS is responsible for selection of authorized medical and dental uh, allowance lists, along with, what, three, is it three different medical kits? Uh, so tell us a little bit more about the portfolio of equipment that uh, that's under your purview, and how do those systems support the warfighter? Absolutely. So we are the, obviously the acquisitions command here at Syscom. We're the acquisitions and sustainment element. We work in close partnership with the capabilities and development and integration branch at Marine Headquarters. Um, and they kind of set what the requirements are, what this, what the people and the, the capability is supposed to be. And then we're the stuff or the maintenance or the sustainment of what those people are supposed to be able to do to execute that capability. So most people are familiar with everything down to one of our kits is our individual first aid kit. Every Marine gets issued um, up to our corpsman assault packs, your dock that goes with the whole infantry battalion everything that's inside that big bag he carries to come help you to save your life. Up to our bigger capabilities that are supported by our units um, embedded, either from the med battalion or the infantry or regimental level medical providers, is we have the forward resuscitation surgical system. That is a role to capability for damage control surgery and damage control resuscitation. Down to our battalion aid station, which is more of a role one care, but still does that trauma response damage control resuscitation. Okay. So an, an example that I have used in, in my daytime job over time has been, yes, that piece of gear might be authorized to, to be used at the University of Chicago Medical Center, but how will it work for us when we take it into the field? And so how do we do that? So you've got, in some cases, there are going to be off-the-shelf solutions. How do you make sure that that will work, as the Marine Corps would say, in any climate place? Perfect. Yeah, our challenge with that is we try really not to have any MOTS products, military off the shelf only, because that really weakens the logistics and the sustainment piece. So we do use a lot of things that seem like the system might need to be unique for the Marine Corps or for the Navy of float platforms, but there are equities in the civilian world with civilian EM, um, EMS and paramedic teams. And so one of our big products is the um, Moves SLC. That is a self-contained portable ventilator, defibrillator that can be, the Marines are really fielding that. We've been fielding the first generation of that for several years now. And we're, this fiscal year, we're modernizing it to the next generation. And it's something that other civilian counterparts, rescues, med flight teams have used because it can, it's independent of the flight platform, the ship platform. It's unique and organic to the patient. And it allows us to really flex that in route care team to whatever lift they need to move that patient on. And that's been a big thing that Marine Corps has been fielding and training on and maintaining for years. And that really makes us honor that expeditionary medicine portion of the Marine Corps mission. We don't have a ship to plug into and we right. don't have a, a fixed structure back at the army hospital to plug into. We have to be able to pack and move and carry whatever we need for our patient and our patient to our next location. So that I think feeds right into my next question, which is about, the golden hour. I mean, I think there's a, some of us have an idea of what this golden hour is. So describe that to us. And what does that mean, you know, in today's Marine Corps out on today's battlefields? Yeah. So for us in the military and uh, medicine, future construct and planning, we actually kind of hate the golden hour rule. That was a luxury of our 
Iraq Afghanistan conflicts, we had air superiority. We had control of the transportation lanes. And so wherever you were injured, there was a high rate of success that we were going to get you to a higher level of definitive care within an hour. And that was because we had secure bases that could we could house our role one, patch you up, get you to role two, more surgical care, all the way to role three, follow on care, and then back to the States. The golden hour is not something we are going to have in our next peer-to-peer conflict because we won't necessarily have that freedom of movement. And so we have to reevaluate what that means for how we position our logistics, how we position our medical personnel, uh, because we now might be holding on to patients and our current planning is trying to push us to plan for 72 to 96 hours. We need to be able to do more medical interventions as far forward as possible and then support those interventions to last so long before we have to go, you know, take them back to a surgical capability, give them more blood. We have to have that capability as far forward. Um, so we have some time to deal with getting them back to the, you know, the mothership. Right. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. So getting back to the acquisition side of the job, share with us a little bit of your team's accomplishments and such over the last year. We've got a couple of them actually we're very proud of. It's been working with TCOM and across the Marine Corps Enterprise. We've got a program of record of the Expeditionally Fresh Whole Blood Program. And so that is, everyone kind of knows of it as the walking blood bank. We have that as a program of record. We have training and a training curriculum that's associated with people to execute that program. We have kits that are now fielded into all of our AMOLs where that's appropriate. And we are building the practice of that into our operational exercises to push the blood capability as far forward as possible because blood saves lives, period. And in support of that same extra fresh whole blood program, um, we have a biomedical engineer on our team. He is worth his weight in gold. He's a wonderful, very smart man. And we have developed an expeditionary medical refrigeration unit. So back in our last 20, 30, 40 years of conflict, we knew blood saved lives, so we developed a hemocool. But as that technology grew, this ruggedized fridge, every unit had to acquire two so they could guarantee getting one. They broke all the time. They're very heavy, and their capacity was fixed. There was no expansion or reduction in the capacity. Our goal was to have the EMRU uh, solve that problem. And so this physical space of the EMRU is half the size of the hemocool. It has a smaller capacity, but... You can buy two of them, and they both actually work. Much more reliable, all right? And it also heats to refrigeration or freezing, doesn't just cool to it. So it works in our Arctic conflicts as well as our desert conflicts. And we've been able to, through small business grants and the Small Business Innovation Program, we've gotten multiple prototypes this year where we've been pushing it to the operational exercises. We've been throwing it out of ospreys and throwing it out of boats to see, does water infiltrate? Can it survive? And so far, everything's maintained working status. Um, All we did was break a handle. And we love that because, you know, we want to give it to our Marines and our medical units and see what they can break. We want to test the limits. It's been so successful in our operational testing that we now have agreements and partnerships with Defense Health Agency to buy, procure more of them, as well as the OPNAV medical team to procure more of them for the float uh, float platforms. So so you're talking about moving whole blood forward, you know, to, to where it needs to be. Movie whole blood or blood components, anything that requires cold chain. So that also isn't limited to blood. That can also be other medical consumables that we haven't been able to field because they required refrigeration. Now, there might be some reagents for expanded laboratory capabilities farther forward. There might be some pharmaceuticals that we can now field farther forward that are critical for surgery in the field that we now have the option because it needed slight refrigeration. We can tuck some of those in there with the blood. Well, I was going to take a moment and put in a plug to tell everybody to go out and get on a regular schedule of giving blood. I know I've got a, an appointment in like two and a half weeks and, you know, my wife and I do it and uh, we, we need the blood. Otherwise, Absolutely. you want to have it to cool and and uh, and save lives. So and, and further plug, there is a national shortage of blood and blood is a very expensive commodity if we have to purchase it from the American Red Cross. So if you can do all civilian and military households a favor and go give blood every six to eight weeks, we'd really appreciate it. We've done our duty in the uh, the Plug the Blood program. Absolutely. All right, so we're still in the middle of a complicated COVID environment. It's obviously better than it was two and a half years ago, uh, but how did the pandemic affect your team's efforts? So I was really lucky. I actually had my permit change station and my assignment here to Marine Corps Systems Command um, in 21, summer of 21, so kind of right in the middle of, it was calming down from the COVID, but then it flared up again. Right. I, from the outside, coming into it and seeing it, I thought our command was already uniquely set up 
to really operate in that distributed workspace and the telework status because we do have to travel so much. We have to go and meet with our war fighters at all four of the mess. We have to meet with vendors all over the country and go to joint program offices. Our team was already traveling very heavily and had full IT support with our Marine Corps assets and our headphones, and we could really work from anywhere. And so when COVID said, you will work from right. anywhere but here, um, I think we were already kind of used to doing that at least 25 to 50% of the time. So when it became 100%, it wasn't a huge shock. It did make checking in weird. I've never checked into a command where my entire check-in was virtual. Right. Um, and But it was some nice things about being at a headquarters, but coming from a hospital, we were full masks, full restrictions, in a healthcare facility, all of COVID, regardless of whether we were sick or not, or, or the counts were low or people were vaccinated here, it, you know, because it was more of an office uh, administrative headquarters type of job role. I didn't have to, I, I got a little bit of a respite of wearing my mask. I mean, I had, by the end of 21, I had blisters behind my ears and on my face from wearing right. my mask constantly at the hospital. So it was so, nice. So I joked with everybody that, uh, that I moved into, I don't know, the 21st century with a telephone that would do facial recognition the same way we all started wearing masks <laughs> and suddenly every time you're trying to do something you, you can't so. All right, so I understand that in April of 2020 that you deployed aboard the USNS Comfort in support of a COVID-19 mission in fact so that was what New York City tell us about that. Uh, it was New York City so um, in uniform unfortunately the Bureau of Medicine Surgery we had such luxury over the last 23 years that people have done whole careers being at a hospital side and never deploying because there were always a small group of us that preferred to do the operational medicine side. Um, and then the fight came to the home front. And so I was really one of the only out of 120 of us uniformed pharmacists that still was maintaining constant skill set in ICU medicine. Okay. And so uh, the oxygen generation plant at Jamaica Hospital in New York failed, and they wheeled 38 intubated patients down the pier onto the comfort in the middle of the night. So my boss called me up and he said, how quickly, if we got you a plane ticket, could you get to New York? And I, he called me, at, it was a Friday morning at 9 a.m. And my bag was already packed because I was on the expeditionary medical facility assignment if they were going to deploy us anywhere else. And so I went home, I grabbed my bag. I said what the plan was to my husband, my two kids, and I was on a plane to LaGuardia that afternoon. It was wonderful professionally for me getting to see myself making an impact it was hard to see how such a large scale healthcare challenge could bring down our country. Um, and the military, I think our line commanders struggled because you couldn't bomb it out of existence or fly away and escape it. It was here, it was on the home front, but I think it really gave the opportunity for military medicine to shine in a different type of disaster. Well, I think for you uh, being here with the Marine Corps, the Marines are used to performing some humanitarian missions, but it's usually a tsunami or a hurricane or something happens elsewhere in the world. So being able to do that, I mean, in New York City, one of the flagship cities here in the country, was, uh, thanks for doing that. And it was alarming. I had a call from the deck with my husband after I got there. I spent about a 13-hour day just working in the ICU to kind of level set and get them, get this the pharmacy department calmed down because the other pharmacists that had been assigned there were brand new officers and they hadn't really ever experienced anything like this. And I'm talking to him from the top deck and we are parked at Pier 1, which is across from Times Square. Okay. And my husband goes, where are you at? It's so quiet there. That's so wonderful. And I said, what are you talking about? It's Times Square back there. And he's just like stunned because we both went to school in New England. We've been to New York a million times. My brother at the time lived in Brooklyn and he was just like, I can't believe Times Square is quiet. He goes, it is 8 p.m. on a Saturday night. And he goes, I can hear you clear as day. The fact that New York City is quiet scares everything out of me. And I said, well, then we're right where we need to be. I would say hearing you describe it that way almost feels like people sharing their 9-11 story. You know, just uh, that kind of a, a formational moment for you. So It was, yeah, it was um, just kind of, Shake you, shake you silly for a minute of, I never expected this city to be quiet again. And we got away from that. We're now, we found a way to move forward right. and, and move and live with COVID and other challenges, healthcare challenges. But yeah, you never expect a city of that size. It's like, I wouldn't expect 
Paris to be quiet and, right. and London to be quiet. I would never expect New York City to be quiet where I could be talking at a normal volume in Times Square on a Friday, Saturday night. All right. Well, we go back to the acquisition stuff then. Uh, but I, again, that was uh, your, your remembrance of that very powerful for me and, and I'm sure for the listeners. So what part does individual feedback play into your processes relative to, you know, the equipment you've got either, you know, in the acquisition process, you know, do you you talk to them during acquisition or even post fielding feedback through, you know, whatever channels you have for getting information back? So our leadership and our team that's on the EMS team right now, I think is really exceptional and that from an acquisition standpoint, purely as a system, we're supposed to always have the warfighter, like it's their needs we're, we're tasked with fulfilling. Um, they, I think, they are the customer in yeah, that case. Absolutely. Um, and I think some of our requirements and um, procurement people, sometimes we lose sight of that. But I think the medical team we have here between EMS and then the Naval Support Branch at CDNI, as well as Training and Education Command um, and Headquarters Marine Corps INL, we all recognize that we have to not be an obstructionary entity. Okay, like our right. end goal is is making sure that what we're feeling is saving lives and increasing lethality because they can trust that they will be taken care of. Right. Um, and so we do modernizations. Our team is responsible for modernizations every three to four years of the capabilities we feel. And we, we pay to have input from that specialty, whatever that capability is, from all four maps. And we meet and we fly them to wherever that meeting is. And we want them to give their input. They don't, their commands do not to fund it. We will fund it. Um, same with every two years we go with Marine headquarters and we do, uh, we meet at their MEF and we have all of their medical teams tell us what they need for the next two or three years based on their operational plans and what they want to do. We've also increased our uh, integration with Marine Corps Warfighting Lab. We have a daily conversation with them because a lot of it was, we're not sharing information from the individual MEFs doing experimental studies and testing or post-fielding testing. We never got that information back. And if we never got it back, they also weren't sharing it across the enterprise. And so we had a bunch of individual medical support units testing the same concepts, but never sharing that data. So that has been a big push the year and a half I've been here is all of us here in Quantico leveraging ourselves as as the Marine Corps medical community. We're no longer speaking all the time as just capabilities branch, just the training and education command. We are, all of us have made a conscious agreement that when we do talk to individual masks, individual field surgeons and things, we talk as a team up here Okay. because we all have a piece of the pie. And I think it's really trickling down to where the individual Marines, nurses, doctors that are fielded with their units know who to call back. And we and they get an answer and then we help them facilitate, okay, how can we move the needle on this? Is this a critical gap? Do we need to push it through an urgent needs request? Is this a simple flip of a switch or a, a miscommunication where we just need to uncross the wires? And I think it, we've seen some s- steady movement toward an improvement with that. So before I ask you the follow-up to that, I will warn you that you run the risk of getting answers because I was asked a similar question mm-hmm. when I was a guest last season and I received multiple emails out from the fleet. So if a Marine or a corpsman or whomever has feedback for you and they Maybe you aren't familiar with the the route to get you that feedback. What should they do? They can go to their immediate, like, doc or surgeon. I'm the only pharmacist for the Marine Corps. So if it's a drug alert question, I guarantee you I get all the questions. And that's fine. I also am the only fleet pharmacist for the OPNAV Navy side. So I get all their questions, too. And people call me all hours a day, personal cell phone and my command phone. But we also have a team email on the Syscom homepage that's just for the Expedition Medical Systems team. And that feeds to me, um, our team lead, Captain Espinal, as well as our senior logistician. We see all of those and we answer them. Okay. So in the show notes, we can post that email address in the show notes. And then Absolutely. so if anybody has anything for you, they can send to it. Yeah. And we've gotten we've gotten them from industry vendors to that email. We have got individual things from colonels, majors that aren't medical, but in, have medical assets in, embedded into their TNO, you know, we will answer those questions or we will help you get an answer. We've had other partners at other branches that get logistics and acquisitions questions that say, and they promised us, they say, that's not my department. However, here's the information right. for the acquisitions and sustainment team. And we want that. If you want to tell me where something has gone right, I love to hear that. 
But if you you tell me something's had a critical failure or it's reduced your capability, we want to know that even more. We want to know why. And if we can produce some data from that to turn to the vendor and say, your, your uh, survivability is, is not accurate okay. once we put it in the field. We have mechanisms to resolve those things, but if we never hear it formally, then uh, we, it's, it's hard for us to move on that. And yes, I know, be careful what you ask for, but... But that's a common yeah. refrain. Mm-hmm. If you never hear it, if you don't know there's a problem, I guarantee you're not working to fix it if, if nobody has ever told you there's a problem. Absolutely. And Absolutely. So, so please come, please email them and let them know and yeah. probably what, no, no, no problem too big, no problem too small. And Yeah, absolutely. All right. all right, so the other services. So normally when I say the other services, I include the Navy as another service, but you are a <laughs> sailor. So, so in this case, when I mean the other services, uh, let's just go with that uh, Army, Air Force, and Space Force. So what kind of relationship do we have with the other services and, and how does it help you in your mission? I will start with the Navy just because even though we are Navy Medicine, I can tell you the Marine Corps, the members of the Navy Medicine and serving with the Marine Corps, we all tend to start serving with the Marine Corps and never leave. Mm-hmm. And our, our numbers are dwindling. And we are purposely trying to bridge that gap back to our Navy fleet partners at Fleet Forces and Expeditionary Combatant Command because um, they are the operational side, not necessarily going through the Bureau of Medicine and Surgery, but going directly to our a float equivalent of our units, and they are pivoting and they're setting up similar systems in the Navy now that um, through um, CNO and the OPNAV office, it's going to be similar to our relationship between CD and I, Marine Corps Systems Command and Headquarters Marine Corps. Um, it's an ex-med office, and we've had, been very fortunate to have two members of our EMS team sit directly on that acquisition building team with okay. OPNAV for a year and a half now. So our relationship with the Navy is hand in hand. If we're going to be fielding these systems, you know, our MUs are going to be on their ships. We should have an opinion on what that new ship hospital ship looks like right. and vice versa with if they're going to develop a capability that's almost identical to the forward resuscitative surgical system. Why do our surgeons, whether they're on the Navy's version or the Marine Corps version, why are they using different stuff and different equipment? Our work with the Army and the Air Force has been a little more slower, glacial maybe. Um, our big interaction with the Air Force that impacts the Marine Corps medical system is our biomedical equipment getting on their authorized patient equipment lists. Um, the Marine Corps is very particular about the equipment that can plug into their air lift platforms. Um, and that's really been the Air Force's role in military medicine has been the patient movement mission. Inter-theater. Extra-theater. Yes, <laughs> inter-theater and intra-theater. Um, and that's been um, a new lesson learned for them when we don't have that golden hour. They have to maybe be more willing to get the other services input on how they are planning on moving patients because um, we're not going to get them intra-theater as fast, which is the, the Air Force's side. So they've come back to the table and we've had a lot of conversations about joint requirements for patient movement assets and joint requirements for military medical equipment. You have to work interoperability issues. So if we if we connect up a patient with a bunch of gear to keep them alive, when you hand them off to a ship, you don't want to have to pull it out off and put it back on, put their stuff on. It just wants to plug in. Same thing with the Air Force then, right? Absolutely. So, you know, it was 10 years ago, but when I was in Afghanistan, when we would be transferring a patient from the Navy trauma hospital, the Air Force patient movement assets would be taking them and they would come and they would take all of our equipment off of the patient and put new equipment on that was authorized to move on their platform. That's a waste of time and resources. Um, I think we're all getting to, we have to fix that and we really have to increase interoperability. And so those conversations, there we have more joint medical programs for with the Army, with the Air Force that involve these big concepts that aren't unique to Marine Corps medicine. So a lot of that is you know, this cold chain, the, the Expedition Medical Refrigeration Unit, the other services, we we were starting the program and we were doing the acquisitions and, and program development of it. But all the other services, hey, we have that same, we need to get blood far forward in a more efficient manner. And so they all started coming, well, can we get in on that? Can we? Right. And so a lot of that is we've gotten to lead the way, I think, on some of the thinking of medicine as a weapon system or as a ship's class. Our other services sometimes haven't done that as well, but we're all getting there. Marine Corps has been doing it for a lot longer, so it just seems more like second nature to us. I, so I think we see that in some other commodity areas where the Marine Corps experiences a problem, we solve it, 
and the other services go, you know, we have a similar problem. Let us, uh, and I think that that's great. And I think that uh, too many people get stuck in a, well, it wasn't invented here philosophy. So it's obviously not the solution we want. And uh, so good. And I know we take great ideas from the other services too. So Well, and it, it also in the end does serve the Marine Corps. Our work with Fleet Forces and, the, and their new operational medicine office and OPNAV, those professional contacts I made, I get a call because there's some forward movement of the new littoral ship that's supposed to serve the Marine littoral regiments. Right. But there wasn't really any people in the room for the planning and review from the Marine Corps. Um, and so I have a Navy colleague that called me and said, hey, this is not a medical question. It's a ship that we're building for the Marine Corps. Do you have someone I can point these questions at or just give them a heads up on the next meeting? And I, to, to your point about how to contact a team, I went on the Syscom webpage and I looked who was responsible for the MLR program. Right, right. And I got a very wonderful lieutenant colonel and colonel, and I said, this isn't medical's realm, but the Navy, big Navy, NAFC is building you a ship, and they don't have any direct input on what the current MLR construct is. So you might want to hear and state your equities. And they were both very grateful. And I said, I can, I can step back now. This is... I'm purely here. You're making the connections. To make the connection. Right, right. Um, and, and that's a benefit because we've been valuable in other realms that other people say, hey, they might, they might know someone that needs to be in this room. And they think of us, and at least to, to pick up that conversation. All right. So industry. So you're doing a lot of work. Obviously, industry, the civilian community does lots and lots and lots of things, but they don't face many of the challenges we do. I'm sure they have their own challenges. But... What's your relationship with industry and, and how does that help us? I think we have a great one. I think the Marine Corps acquisition system does teach us um, how to operate everything down to small businesses, up to larger contractors, vendors, and industry partners. Our team, every pharmaceutical company, every biomedical equipment company wants, you know, they have a new capability and they want us to put it on our, our capabilities. They want us to help get it, you know, buy it and get it on those line lists. We get asked by industry partners all the time, and our team's standard response is send us the documentation, the, the pamphlet, if you will, of what your product does and what it can and cannot do. We present it to the team because we have a wonderful team of a retired FMF corpsman who used to be a radiology tech, who is now one of my senior program analysts. We have a lot of logisticians, myself and our biomedical engineer. We talk about it as a team. Do we, do we see any need or gap in our current field of capabilities that this could meet? or satisfy? Um, is it a modernization on something we are feeling that's not great? Could we f- feel this item and is it worth the initial or the increased investment? And if it is, we will have um, meetings with them. We'll bring them in, have them do you know a hands-on demonstration if we can see the item, any more in-depth demonstration. We had a company that is exploring the possibility of like in-line manufacturing of pharmaceuticals as needed rather than a whole production line, you know, something where you could have a box that you could type in the recipe you wanted it to make and it could be. I need some penicillin. Exactly. The technology uh, was brought to us to at least look at. We went up, we brought in the other services to come talk about it. It's 10, 20 years out, but we at least entertained the idea. We had lots of questions. We went on a plant tour. We were talking about this and kind of gave them some honest feedback of, you know, it's not anywhere near prime time for the Marine Corps because we got to be ready to put it into the field, but recommended some civilian partners and, and hospital systems that might help them get there one day. Um, so we try to keep a pretty open door policy, but we also, you know, acquisitions are not here to keep the industrial base in business. Um, we have our requirements and we need modern cost-effective solutions to meet those requirements. So I was going to ask about the requirements. You're a little constrained. If you have no requirement to, to handle a specific problem, then solutions aimed at that problem, you might not be able to do anything with. Yeah, and then we, and then that's a conversation that I have multiple times a day with CD and I, because they are our requirements writers, they are right. our requirements generators, and um, we need to be looking at those requirements just as often as we are looking at the items that are supposed to fulfill those. And so we are in a big push with our CD and I medical team to uh, update in the, it's an aggressive timeline, but update our medical program requirements over the next two or three years in anticipation of the new force modernization push and where medical fits in that. So so an example, uh, you said you talked to your CD&I folks. Well, if they, um, 
if the last time they thought of something, industry, the state of the art, just wasn't able to do it, they never would have given us a completely unaccomplishable requirement. But now if industry has moved forward, if they've been very innovative and they've come up with a solution to a problem, you you maybe now could turn around to CD&I and CD&I can now write a requirement because there are solutions out there. So that hits on, so what kind of innovations or things maybe are you looking for from industry? Because I know we have industry people who listen to the podcast. So what are you looking for? So, um, you know, the Expertry First Whole Blood Program, becoming a program record was a big one. Like, Walking blood bank and like that viability as a as an option in the field was never a requirement. Now it is a requirement. The whole blood transfusion capability is a requirement because the technology met there. We now have kits that were out there. We have a training curriculum that was developed by companies to make it a program that could increase lethality, could increase survivability of the individual Marines, and that became a standard requirement now. So I think a lot of what we're looking right now, where our requirements need to be updated, is. The ability um, with a low footprint, with the maximal capacity, so patient capacity for our biomedical equipment, our ventilators, okay. our, you know, we have our Moves SLC system that's coming online that can do it. You, if we keep, if we decide we need it in the future, you can do anesthesia through it as well, but it's a ventilator and a defibrillator. It's one per patient. Is there something where you can make it even smaller? Right now, that device is, is big and heavy. Um, can you? Make it even smaller, but maybe make it for two patients per, you know, increase the capacity, but make it space is a commodity Mm -hmm. in our setting. Weight is a commodity. Someone's carrying these things around. Anything that can be like lighter, but increase the capability, particularly from our biomedical standpoint, our lab capability, these machines that can give us this really wonderful diagnostic data that helps us make decisions with higher accuracy, higher reliability, lower power footprint. That's And that's a big thing for the medical team right now is common batteries, common power solutions. We're not going to necessarily be able to plug in somewhere and right. charge. So that's what we would really like to see from our biomedical equipment people is capabilities that have maintained the requirement, but maybe expanded the capacity of that requirement and made it lighter. Can go off grid. Yeah, and more expeditionary. So, Commander, we have a decent number of younger listeners to our to our audience, and... Maybe some of them who are just starting out in their careers, trying to figure out where they want to go. For you, as a woman in a STEM field, what kind of advice would you give any others, men or women, obviously, but uh, who might be interested in a career in, in the medical field? Uh, I would say go for it. I was always much better at science and math. So I just always gravitated toward those things. I never honestly thought I was going to be a healthcare worker. I wanted to be a hard chemist and just be in a lab and be happy doing that for the rest of my life. And I had my mom who pushed me to look at STEM camps or STEM programs or like day camps. It would just let me see the different varieties and potential because I think working in healthcare, particularly military healthcare or military science in some way, you don't have to be in uniform. We have some wonderful partners, but I personally think the Navy and the Office of Naval Research, ONR, is really focused on STEM education as a workforce development tool. At the Naval Academy, they have full sleepaway camps at the Naval Academy to support their STEM program. And it is really robust. I actually got to be trained by them. And I was the STEM coordinator on Camp Lejeune, where I brought in middle schoolers, high schoolers to come see the hospital. We also showed them the new 3D printing lab we put on Camp Lejeune. We supported the DOD educational activities robotics team from the middle school through an ONR grant for STEM education. So I would just look for any of those. I think the government really does a great job with elementary, middle school, high school, even college level STEM education, STEM career fields, not necessarily just healthcare. I love hearing that. I know that here at our command, we have a very active you know program where we go out and we run these STEM camps and so while I've never questioned the value of those, here I am and I hear you talking about how you, uh, you know, explored those when, when you were a kid and you said your mom, you know, pushed you into those. And, uh, and so that is phenomenal, you know, that whoever was running those programs for you at the Naval Academy, wherever, congratulations. Because of you, we have Commander Kelly Donovan here. And so with us running those programs and everybody else, they are creating 
the future Commander Donovans. And so... Or weapons engineers or sh- right. ship design, ship architecture uh, and navigators and all these wonderful things that, once again, you're not just thinking in the construct of what someone thinks a pharmacist does or someone thinks a sailor does. Right. Um, you can do all of these wonderful things. And you, some of them you can do in uniform, some of them you do out of uniform, but still working with our government partners and our DUD partners. And you're still contributing to the overall mission of our defense and our security in the United States and the armed forces. And I think it's just really valuable and wonderful. Well, I, I love hearing the success story of the early STEM camps and stuff yeah, like that. So absolutely. thanks for relating that. I, I very much enjoyed having you here today and, and thank you about that. And you've talked about a lot of the great things that your team has done in the past. Can you give us what is next for the MS team? Our big thing is we just held a full capabilities-based assessment um, for the entire Marine Corps medical programming. And that's something that the entire Marine Corps medical system hasn't done from a, you know, acquisitions program baseline standpoint. We haven't done it. Uh, We did that. It was a week long here. We brought people from all over. We had more than 90 Marine Corps warfighting medical personnel, logistics colonels, everybody come in to tell us where our gaps are. We want to get ahead of this force modernization and get ahead of that future fight that we know is coming. Uh, And medical's not absent of that. We have a role in there that we're making a lot of changes to support the Marine Corps force design um, 2030 structure, and we have to catch up. And so that was a big lift for us. We're getting those gaps identified. We've gotten them prioritized, and we are chipping away at monitoring the doctrine and the requirements and then our acquisitions plan. So when the resourcing comes, we can we can monitorize all that stuff so we stay as lethal as we are. And our Marines and our Navy partners can trust that medical that is embedded there will be trained and ready and equipped to save their life so they can continue to go out and be as lethal as we've always been. Well, we look forward to to great things from you and your team. So thank thank you. Thank you. So Commander Donovan, again, I very much appreciated this conversation. We have a little thing around here that we call the lightning round. And do you think you're ready for the lightning round questions? Absolutely. All right. First question. When you were a child, what did you want to be when you grew up? A super nerdy. Um, I really wanted to be the, movie, the book Hot Zone by Mac Crichton. I wanted to be a virus hunter. I did. I wanted to be like in the lab, all wrapped up, like solving all the nasty things that hide in the jungle. Like that was what I wanted to do. So if you, when you said <laughs> Crichton, I was thinking, didn't, didn't, didn't you write Outbreak as well? And... At which Hot Zone, the movie was written. Yeah. It's, okay. It's the same. It's Outbra- all okay. the same concept okay. of like, I thought that's what I was going to do. I was going to go work. Oh, was that the book for this movie? Mm-hmm. Okay, yes. all right, there we go. So we are talking about the same thing. Absolutely. If you could have dinner with any historical figure, who would it be? That would be Marie Curie. Nice choice. I, I think she explored things we knew nothing about in regards to radiation, purely just for the science of it, because she saw the benefit to mankind, despite the fact that it became clear it was harming her and her colleagues. They didn't know why, but she just she was like, we're going to do this. We're just going right. to keep doing this for the sake of discovering something that is going to be better for the world. Do you have any tips for maintaining a work-life balance? I, uh, full disclosure, I have a non-military husband and a five and an eight-year-old. So our big secret is that we just talk about everything. Someone told me early on if I was going to have a successful military career and have my family there beside me is I had to include them as part of the service member. So my husband gets the first phone call if there's any discussion, even informal, about a new job, a new duty station, a deployment, my husband gets the first phone call and he has gotten that at every point in my career. And now we include my kids on that conversation too, because they are impacted by it as well. And so they get that respect from me. And that way they always know when I'm talking about my career, the next things that I'm at the forefront of their mind. And they know when I'm away, it's because I'm doing something worth it, but I'm they're there with me. A lot of my Team knows my kids. They hear them in the background if, if they're home from school one day while we have meetings. Or the Navy considers my husband like an honorary member because he's at every award ceremony. He's at every meeting. When I do have to travel, he helps me pack my bags and get where I have to go on time. And he's my biggest cheerleader. And so I think giving the people you choose to have in your life, if you want them to be respectful to your career and there at the end or every the big phases of your career, then you need to make it clear that they are a priority when you are talking about your work or when you're negotiating for your work. That's helped us a lot. I think it's very refreshing when I hear today how much um, the military goes out of its way 
to try to meet the needs of military spouses because what the military spouses do for the service member, you know, and, and take things up on the home, home front while you're out doing whatever your, your military job is. And then for myself, even I grew up as a Navy brat myself. And so your kids are growing up, gonna, you know, they're growing up as Navy brats. And so uh, you're doing the right thing. Make yeah. sure that they understand what mom is doing and, and why she's doing it. And, and they'll respect that. Yeah. My husband, um, he was a stay at home dad. Uh, for the first five years of our kids' lives, and he got, the job he has now is wonderful, and he got it from a Marine Corps spouse hiring event at Camp Lejeune. Okay, he's not still with that same company, but he got it through getting the job with that company, and then getting introduced to this next opportunity through that company. And so, we're a big fan of maximizing those opportunities when they present themselves. So, what is a TV show, book, movie, or podcast that you would recommend? Oh, I, I am, with all the travel I've been doing for this job, I am a big fan of podcasts lately because I got sick of listening to all my music. So I think the Wondery Podcast House have these really one, good ones called American Scandal and American History Tellers. And okay. so they pick a topic that I think we all hear about in, you know, school, but we don't like know and they deep dive on it. And so one of the most recent ones was like the Age of American Piracy. Um, in the 1600s, it was like four episodes of like behind all the myths. What who were the actual pirates from North Carolina down to the Caribbean? And another one is a deep dive in more recently was Ameri- uh, the national park system. How did okay. the national park system come to be? How did it become so political? Who were its champions? What are the economic pitfalls as it tried to get off the map? And it's just stuff that like you know of it, but you don't. We go to the you parks. Don't really know, and it's. Really, really enjoyed that. Okay. Really enjoyed listening to those. And I wrote to my family into listening to them too. All right. Well, thank you very much for coming in and, and giving us an hour of your time. And uh, we appreciate it. And continue doing everything you do for the Navy, the Marine Corps, our country, and your family. Oh, thank you. Thank you for having me. It was a pleasure. This concludes another episode of Equipping the Corps. I hope you've enjoyed our conversation today. If so, please take a couple minutes to leave us a review subscribe, and tell your friends about us. Until next time, stay safe. This is Trip Elliott, signing off.